Well, thanks uh, for the introduction. Um, thanks to the Chicago Council for organizing this and all the other events that have been leading into the summit. It's been an extraordinary service, uh, I think, to connect the people of Chicago to this very important international event. Um, and I'm pleased to be joined here by, of course, uh, Liz uh, and uh, the three ambassadors uh, from such important allies in the United States. Um, I will say to the uh, Czech ambassador, um, when uh, I was first beginning in my job, our first foreign trip to Europe uh, was going to be uh, to the Czech Republic, among other countries. Uh, and the uh, Czech, Czech ambassador, your predecessor, got uh, word of the fact that the president was going to give a big speech in the Czech Republic. Um, so he came in to see me, um, and he offered his thoughts, and he gave me a gift, which was a giant oversized pop-up book called The History of the Great Czech People. Um, and uh, in speaks one, uh, to the humor of, uh, of uh, the Czech Republic. I have that still in my office, and people come and see all these serious policy books on the shelf, but then they take this down and open it up, and there's a pop-up of the Charles Bridge, and uh, I think, uh, again, it's a memento that I'll, I'll carry with me. Uh, I also mentioned earlier this morning, um, you know, when we were looking at what city in the United States would host the NATO summit, um, we considered a number. Uh, the president very much wanted to take the summit outside of Washington uh, so he could showcase and highlight an American city. Um, and there were a number of uh, reasons that we chose uh, Chicago. Uh, one is just that it's a, a global city capable of uh, uh, hosting such a significant event. Um, two, uh, of course, it's the president's hometown, and he always looks for reasons and excuses to get back here. Um, but also, he uh, uh, is very proud of the city, and, and as Liz and I were noting today, um, in recent meetings with foreign leaders, he's been bragging about Chicago um, and saying, you're not going to believe what you're going to see. Uh, Chicago's going to put on a great show. Um, third, of course, was your incredibly diplomatic uh, and soft-spoken mayor, um, <laughs> who's <laughs> um, very well known to some of us in, in, the, uh, in the White House and uh, was a, a, you know, an advocate for uh, Chicago, of course. Um, but I think also the diversity of the people of Chicago um, and a diversity that speaks uh, to the diversity of NATO as well. Um, earlier today, for instance, we spoke with um, some of the Baltic community here in Chicago, um, and the Lithuanian ambassador was there. Um, I, I mentioned the story, too, of uh, how I came to appreciate more um, the diaspora populations from Central and Eastern Europe back in the United States. Uh, when I was working on that speech that the president gave in Prague, we had learned a lesson from the speech he gave in Berlin, where you know we had 250,000 people outside. Germans speak very good English, but it's still hard for them to follow and know exactly what the president's saying. So <laughs> to make sure that uh, we didn't have that challenge again, we had jumbotrons up uh, in the square in Prague and 25,000 Czechs. And I said to the embassy, we need a translator uh, so we can give them the text of the speech the night before, and the speech can play on the jumbotron. Um, and when we got to our hotel, I asked the embassy, where's the translator? Uh, and they said, oh, the translator's in Virginia. Um, so I ended up having to call back and uh, read the speech to someone to translate it back in the United States so it could be posted up on the screen in, uh, in Prague. And the biggest applause lines, of course, had to do with Chicago uh, and the fact that there are so many checks from Chicago. Um, but with that, I'll just say a few words here about um, our goals for the summit. Um, and I think, first of all, the reason the president wanted to host the NATO summit in general uh, is because alliances are central to his foreign policy um, and central to his view of the world. Um, he very much believes that the United States is far stronger uh, when we're working in concert with others uh, and building coalitions to share burdens uh, and deal with common challenges. And when we came into office, we had a number of immediate things that we had to deal with on the foreign policy and national security side. Um, things, of course, that extended back into the previous administration, whether it was ending the war in Iraq um, on a responsible timeline, uh, refocusing our efforts uh, on al-Qaeda, stabilizing al uh, Afghanistan, which was going to take additional resources, um, a number of urgent uh, challenges before us, um, securing loose nuclear weapons and materials around the world, um, and of course dealing with the global economic crisis. But even as we were dealing with the inbox of national security, um, the President set about to strengthen the foundations uh, of how America engages in the world. Um, and really the core foundation is our alliance and our alliance with Europe uh, and our alliance with NATO. Um, that's because these are countries with whom we share democratic values. Uh, and at a time when there are competing ideologies and systems in the world, as is always the case, 
Uh, we believe that America is stronger and more prosperous when more countries are democratic. Um, and the clearest instance of that is uh, the extraordinary security and prosperity that has come from the enlargement of uh, peace, security, and democracy in Europe. Uh, these are countries with whom we share common interests. Uh, when we sit across the table from our European allies, uh, we agree with them about a lot more than we disagree with them. Uh, and Liz and I have been in more than one meeting with the president where he's had a difficult meeting with a, let's just say, a non-ally, uh, and then meets with a, one of our European friends, and afterwards he'll say to us, sometimes it's really good to have allies. <laughs> um, uh, but you know, these are countries with whom we share common interests. These are countries with whom we need to consolidate the gains uh, of uh, the 20th century. Uh, and we spoke earlier today about the fact that um, even as we have a global view as Americans, even as we're preoccupied often with events in the Middle East and North Africa and Afghanistan, and even as we are working very aggressively to take our foreign policy into the Asia Pacific region and increase our reach and our markets into that fast growing part of the world, uh, that we very much still see Europe as the cornerstone of our engagement. And that includes consolidating European security and making sure that, again, Europe remains uh, whole, free, and at peace, uh, and that the progress we've seen, for instance, among our Central and Eastern European friends over the course of the last 20 years is extended not just within those countries, but to the remaining part of Europe's periphery that has not uh, completed that, uh, that journey yet. Um, and the other thing I'd say is Europe is our partner of first resort, our partner of first choice for working on global issues. Um, Europe, or, Europe and America work together in just about every challenge that we face. Uh, and the President spoke about this when he was in London. Um, and he went through uh, our shared cooperation on economic issues, on security issues, and he told the story uh, of our intervention in Libya, uh, where we intervened with our European allies and stopped a, a massacre uh, and ultimately ended the Qaddafi regime. And part of his message uh, was, after telling that story, if we didn't do this, who would? There's nobody else in the world, no other country, uh, that seeks to play the role that the United States and Europe play together in the world. Uh, there's a lot of talk uh, about China uh, and its rising economy. Uh, but even with its growing economic influence, uh, you don't, for instance, see China seeking to play that type of role in expanding uh, global security, certainly expanding human rights and development and global health. Uh, as the United States and Europe do together. Um, so for all those reasons, um, because of those shared interests, those shared values, and that shared sense of responsibility uh, to one another and to the rest of the world, um, the transatlantic alliance and the European uh, friendship that we have and the NATO alliance that we have uh, has been at the core of the President's effort to strengthen that foundation of American foreign policy. Um, all of this will intersect here in Chicago, uh, where we'll have dozens of heads of state and I'll just say a few words about the summit, and then I know Liz uh, will add on uh, the NATO piece in particular. Um, there are really three broad categories that we've highlighted uh, for what we're trying to achieve uh, in Chicago. Uh, the first is making sure that NATO continues to have the capabilities it needs to be the premier security alliance in the 21st century, as it has been in the past. Um, and again, in a context of cutting budgets uh, and fiscal austerity in much of our countries, this is going to have to involve very smart decisions uh, by our governments and by our alliance so that nations are investing in the right things uh, and the alliance can serve as a force multiplier. Uh, and Liz will talk about a number of those important capabilities that we'll be focusing on, uh, like missile de defense, for instance, uh, here in Chicago. Uh, second, we're going to focus on partnerships. Uh, and what we mean by this is NATO as a hub of a global network of relationships. Um, we have consolidated the North Atlantic community uh, within an enlarged uh, NATO. Uh, we have an open door policy where we're continuing to discuss uh, NATO membership with aspirants. But we also work globally uh, in Asia, for instance, with countries like Korea and Japan and Australia. In, Lib in Libya, for instance, for the first time, you had Arab countries, uh, Gulf states, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, and Jordan operating under a NATO command. And essentially, we want to build a network of relationships with non-NATO member states, but states that can cooperate with us and expand the reach of the NATO alliance so it is truly global and it can deal with challenges like terrorism and piracy and cyber threats uh, that are increasingly going to drive uh, the security environment of the 21st century. Uh, but of course, we're going to be dealing with Afghanistan. Um, and I'll just say a few words about this because I think, of course, it'll be a major focus of the, of the NATO summit. And the way we've looked at it is there's been several important milestones in the President's Afghanistan policy. 
Uh, of course, when he took office, we felt the situation had drifted. Um, as with our efforts against al-Qaeda, the attention had shifted to Iraq. Um, and we sought to reorient American national security policy so that we could end the war in Iraq, increase resources into Afghanistan, increase resources against al-Qaeda, so as to effectively, ultimately, wind down that conflict as well. Uh, and there have been a number of key milestones. The President's decision uh, to, in December of 2009 to put in substantial additional resources, of course, which was accompanied by additional resources by our allies. Um, that led up to his announcement, uh, our announcement in Lisbon, uh, together with NATO allies um, in December of 2010, uh, where we came together and agreed on a transition plan, uh, whereby we would begin to transition to Afghanistan control of parts of the country uh, in 2011, uh, and complete a process of transition uh, by 2014. Um, and that created a framework for essentially how we would begin to wind down our involvement in Afghanistan while also looking to an enduring relationship with the government and security, of, uh, security forces of Afghanistan um, after 2014. Uh, we've, of course, in the context of this, continued our efforts against al-Qaeda uh, and made significant gains against what was our core goal, of course, which was defeating al-Qaeda and denying it the chance to reestablish a safe haven in Afghanistan. Um, and on Tuesday, uh, we'll mark one year from the operation uh, that took out uh, Osama bin Laden, uh, which I think is the clearest manifestation of that effort. Following on that operation and, and the beginning of transition in Afghanistan, last June, President Obama announced that we would begin to draw down American forces within the context uh, of the Lisbon transition. So 33,000 American troops total uh, he ordered home by the end of this uh, summer, the summer of 2012. 10,000 of those troops left um, last year uh, and were out by December. Another 23,000 will be drawn down by the end of this summer. And he made clear, the President did at that time, uh, that we would be continuing those reductions at a steady pace, but a responsible one alongside our NATO allies um, as the transition moves forward. Uh, we won't be announcing troop numbers um, uh, in Chicago. What we'll be uh, discussing is the next phase of this process of transition from where we are now. So when President Obama announced that we would host a NATO summit this May, um, he was very clear that this would be the next milestone. This summit will be the next time for the alliance to come together with the Afghan government uh, and discuss uh, what, where we stand in Afghanistan and what the next phase is going forward. Uh, and we've been in very intensive discussions with our NATO partners and with our ISAF partners and with Afghanistan, and most recently in uh, Brussels. Now, it's important to understand that transition, this process of handing over responsibility to the Afghans, is already underway. Uh, approximately 50% of the Afghan population is currently living in areas that have already transitioned or are transitioning to Afghan lead, uh, which means that the Afghan security forces are in the front and responsible for securing those areas. Meanwhile, the Afghan security forces themselves are growing uh, both in number and capability. And in Chicago, we expect leaders to come together. They'll reaffirm the Lisbon framework for transition. But they'll also look towards an interim milestone in 2013 when Afghan security forces will move into the lead uh, for combat operations. Coalition forces uh, will move into a support role. Um, in some parts of the country, of course, we would continue to fight alongside Afghan forces. Um, but increasingly, this would advance that phase of transition so that the Afghans are moving forward and taking responsibility for their country. Increasingly, uh, we are doing training, advising, assisting to those Afghan forces. By the end of 2014, uh, as agreed to in Lisbon, uh, this transition will be complete, and Afghan security forces and the Afghan government will be fully responsible for the security of their country. We'll, of course, continue to be able to train, advise, and assist them uh, throughout this process. Um, but as we did in Iraq, uh, what we'll see is a, a gradual handover uh, of responsibility uh, over time. What we'll also be discussing uh, at the summit is how do we support Afghanistan going forward? Because we believe we can meet our objective. Uh, we can meet our objective of defeating al-Qaeda. Uh, we can meet our objective of building competent Afghan security forces and an Afghan government that can stand on its own two feet. But we need to make sure that after we reduce our presence, uh, that al-Qaeda is not able to regenerate and the Afghan government is able to continue to provide for its own security. So the allies uh, in Chicago will be discussing uh, what our commitment is to sustainable Afghan security forces over time. Uh, essentially, what is the size of the Afghan army and police uh, that the Afghan government believes they need uh, to secure their country, and then what kind of support can we provide to them? 
um, whether it's training or direct assistance. The United States, like many other countries uh, within NATO and ISAF, uh, has also been negotiating a strategic partnership with Afghanistan, which will define the relationship between our two countries on the other end of transition. Uh, and that's going to mean cooperation uh, in the security area, of course, but in many other areas, um, on the economic side, education, uh, in Afghanistan's commitment uh, to human rights and women's rights. Um, and I saw today, for instance, that there was a remarkable event here in Chicago where uh, a school here was uh, linked up to an Afghan school, uh, and those kids were able to communicate across an enormous geographic divide. Um, it speaks to the type of people-to-people -people bonds and exchanges uh, that can define a relationship when you're able to move beyond a period of war. Um, and again, from where, where we sit, uh, our objectives uh, uh, were what they were when we went in after 9-11, uh, which was to defeat al-Qaeda, deny them a safe haven. Um, in doing so, uh, we think that we can leave behind a better Afghanistan and an Afghanistan uh, that can provide for its people and have better relationships with the United States, with NATO member states, uh, and the rest of the world. So this will be a major milestone um, in our Afghanistan policy um, and a key outcome of the Chicago summit. I'd just end on this concept of alliances one more time because they too are a unique asset of the United States <laughs> and of the three countries that are joining us today and of all of our NATO allies. Um, when you think about it, uh, not only is NATO the strongest alliance in the world, it's unique. Other countries don't have alliances like this. They don't have a network uh, of so many countries that share their values and their interests. That's something that America can count on. That's something that each of these three countries can count on. We're force multipliers for each other. And we're far stronger when we're able to act together and we're able, able to count on each other in international forums. That obviously begins with the core commitment of NATO, the Article 5 commitment that an attack on one is an attack on all. Uh, at the Baltic event earlier, we were able to reflect on how powerful that commitment is to countries that have only known independence now for two decades, uh, but have the confidence that not just the United States, but all of NATO is going to protect their sovereignty as preciously as we would protect our own. And for Americans uh, who, might, uh, who might not have the same experience of knowing that um, just 20 years ago they could make their own decisions uh, about their foreign policies and their, uh, their future, we should keep in mind that it was Article 5 that was invoked on our behalf uh, after the 9-11 attacks uh, when our allies stood up and said that they would be with us. Uh, and 10 years after those attacks, uh, often um, in unpopular circumstances, candidly, um, you still have so many NATO member states fighting alongside uh, our troops in Afghanistan and training uh, Afghan uh, government officials, Afghan security forces alongside us. Uh, so the Article 5 commitment really binds us together and runs both ways. Um, but again, I think what the new allies um, show us um, and I used the phrase new allies knowing that Liz is going to come up here and quote the president as always. Uh, his comment is there's no such thing as new allies and old allies, they're just allies. Um, but what those new member states uh, who've come into NATO in the recent decades remind us um, is that we can never take for granted how precious uh, this alliance is, uh, that history is never that far behind us, uh, and that we cannot grow complacent, uh, and that the values that make us all a part of one alliance are things that are truly worth fighting for. Um, so I think that, that's what guides us, that's what animates us uh, going forward. And I think each of these three countries, Lithuania, Romania, and the Czech Republic, uh, have proven to be steadfast allies of the United States, uh, countries that are moving in remarkably positive directions. Uh, so we very much look forward to the opportunity to have a continued dialogue about this. Uh, Liz here uh, can now speak in some more detail about our NATO agenda. Um, but again, I would like to personally thank um, all of you um, in the city of Chicago uh, for rolling out the red carpet. Uh, I'm a former Chicago native, well not native, I lived here for a year and a half during the campaign. Um, it felt like longer than that. Uh, there are many nights that I walked out of 233 North Michigan at 11.30, not to go home, but to go buy uh, Red Bull at the uh, 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 supermarket across the street. So a lot of my Chicago time was spent inside that campaign office, but it had great views. So I at least was able to look out at Michigan Avenue uh, and think about what a wonderful city this is. So we think it's going to be a great showcase. Chicago is going to put on a great show and a great summit. It shows the best of the United States. It shows, again, again, the best of the diversity that binds us together with so many of our allies like the three we're here with today. Uh, so thank you very much, and I'll hand it over to Liz.